So early this morning, Central Standard Time, it was about 5 a.m. I woke up and read some documents about it. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, also known as the Dicastery of the Doctrine of the Faith, released its newest dicastery document called Dignitas Infinita. It was released via press conference today, April the 8th, in Rome at something like noon local time. It's the transferred feast of the Annunciation there. That's why they did it. The new text aims to highlight a line from Fratelli Tutti, namely that dignity exists beyond all circumstances. That's interesting. That's true. And in a word, it's precisely what I expected of this document. I was talking to a friend yesterday, a, a lawyer friend of mine, Ryan, who said, look, what do you think is going to be in this thing? And I, I haven't paid a lot of attention to it, in all frankness. This is not one of the ones I've been looking out for for a long time. I heard about it briefly last week or the week before, and I said, here's my prediction. Common, un." Shocking. Uh, this will be one of the moments of the Francis pontificate where uh, normies will be spiking the football because there's going to be nothing shocking, conscience shocking in it. And my friend Ryan agreed. This is like when Francis, from time to time, will admit that there are, I don't know, three persons in the Holy Trinity or that Jesus walked the earth a little bit over 2,000 years ago. Or that, you know, there are seven sacraments or something like that. So the document highlights human dignity. It's a very safe topic. It's a very, very safe topic. And um, there are moments in the document, lines, where, as Life Sites article makes clear in the title, abortion's condemned, and, and so is... Uh, Gender theorem. Yeah, that's fine. So abortion and gender theorem. These are two well-established and, and quite safe to condemn topics for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And as promised, they do condemn abortion and gender theory. Now, I had a, a phone conversation last week with another friend. And we were talking about the expectations that a Roman Catholic ought to level at a Roman Catholic prelate. I, when I say that I feel very consistently, very profoundly let down by Pope Francis, or that I used to early in this 11-year pontificate, what I meant is this. Frequently, in a number, in an integer greater than zero frequency, I have felt strongly and used my intellect to strongly gather the point that this Pope is a kind of revolutionary of sorts, that he does not favor doctrine that does not and cannot change one or more times over the last 11 years. The number's far more than one. That's what I do mean when I utter such words. What I don't mean, what I do not mean, and I've cautioned you all, trads and normies alike, is constructing this phrase, oh, Francis isn't so faithful. Francis is rather revolutionary. Francis doesn't love to defend doctrine. It doesn't mean, and I don't think anyone out there believes it means, that Francis always and everywhere in a thousand lines out of a 1,000 line document condemns known true quantities in the Roman Catholic Church, which is why I say he, he admits the Trinity has three persons in it. Grudgingly, maybe, I don't know, 
I don't know, maybe not. He admits there are seven sacraments. He admits that Christ walked the earth, you know, starting starting uh, about 2020 years ago, 2024 years ago. He admits that whatever, there are three major sects of Christian, Protestant, Eastern Orthodox, Catholic. He admits all kinds of things about Roman Catholic history that are accurate. And in this document, Dignitas Infinita, he admits that the longstanding, not particularly controverted or controvertible teachings of the church on abortion are that it's always and everywhere wrong. And that gender theorem is always and everywhere wrong. Freely. So I'm not sure. Well, I, I, I can help you mine to where he's probably going with the document. I can actually do that for you, and I will in a moment. But facially, I'm not sure why would you release a document that states such obvious truisms, paraphrastically obvious truisms. I'm, I don't know, unless it's going someplace darkling. Imagine if we woke up tomorrow and at noon Rome local time, 5 a.m. CST, I got up, there's a second document, and it says two and two equal four. And we, we released this by a press conference, because apparently these guys think it's the year 1993. And it's a big deal, and I want everyone to read it, that it turns out two and two equals four. Well, yeah, all of my concelebrants, my well-wishers, my colleagues, the tried and true who believe that this is somehow through all of the material heresy, a good and holy pontificate, number 266, they're going to say, well, look, there are no errors in this. Two and two equal four in the two and two equal four document, hypothetically speaking, if this were to be released tomorrow. And I'd say, well, yeah, there's no errors. You, you got it. No, hundred, You're right. You're right, Pope Splainers. No errors that I can see in Dignitas Infinita April the 8th. And no hypothetical errors in this fake document, April the 9th, 2 and 2 equals 4. But why release it? There are a million truisms I could state without error. And there are a million truisms you or any, more, more than you or I, any leader in the world, let alone the most important leader in the world, could release a document with much fanfare to be inclusive of. Part of this has to do with Francis. Part of it has to do with his doctrinal number two in the church. We've thought he might get he might get fired at some point. Cardinal Victor Manuel Tucho Fernandez, who released his long anticipated document on human dignity, written in line with Pope Francis's encyclical Fratelli Tutti and modern teaching on dignity. It condemns abortion and surrogacy while notably remaining silent on. Skittles. LifeSite makes a big deal about the fact that the document's silent on Skittles. I don't know if you, I don't know. I don't think this is completely unreasonable. I don't think it also is a deafening silence where it makes it so notable that you have to talk about it's silent on Skittles. I think it could go either way. I'll give you more of my thoughts in a second. But the point is, Francis and Tucho Fernandez are not always necessarily of one mind. Tucho has been an embarrassment to Francis. So this is likely one of those not significantly less embarrassing moments in the Francis pontificate where because they've had so many, such a majority of the moments have been embarrassing moments, they're just like, let's just announce this document, make a big deal out of it, and it'll say something as banal as two and two equals four. I'm not sure if the silence on Skittles, on SS unions and things like that, that's what I mean by Skittles, is deafening or not. LifeSite thinks it is. Maybe that's right. I can tell you where they're going with it. We'll talk about that in a second. There is something here in this document that you ought to consider 
more than everything else. And I'm, I'm going to talk about what that is. First, I want every one of you who lives in a blue state to get out, move to a red state, and the way to go about starting that undertaking is to go for, to uh, www.realestateforlife.org. A pro-life, probably Catholic person will help you to find your way through the process and it will make it significantly easier www.realestateforlife.org. Get out of your blue state, get to a red state today. I did it. And it does, as a matter of simple fact, improve your standard of living. I got went from the bluest to the blue, the reddest to the red. And I'm thankful every day, even through the tornadoes here in the, the Dixie uh, tornado belt. The second major thing is to... Like this video, subscribe, click the notification bell. If you want to support the channel, that's the easiest and most immediate way you can do it. You can help out infinitely. It helps more than you probably realize. You can do it right now. Even if you don't have cash free monthly to send to this channel, please do it right now. Subscribe. We need everyone who's watching to be subscribed. Now, if you have 10 or 15 or 20 bucks per month that you want to send to the channel, do it through Locals or Subscribestar. The links are below. So as you're liking and subscribing to this channel and clicking the notification bell, you can go to either Locals or Subscribestar. We got kicked off of Patreon for sticking to our guns. and I've been kicked out of jobs for sticking to my guns. If you want to support that kind of Catholic content, Patreon is not it. Locals and subscribes are, are it. Released by a press conference April the 8th, the new text, Dignitas Infinita, aims to highlight a line from Fratelli Tutti, namely that dignity exists beyond all circumstances. The declaration strives to show that this is a universal truth that we are called to recognize as a fundamental condition for our societies to be truly just, peaceful, healthy, and authentically human, writes Fernandez, prefect of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, and from whose office the document emerged. As summarized, I'm reading from the LifeSide article now, as summarized by An Andrea Tornielli, editorial manager for the Vatican's Dicastery for Communication, the document aims to address issues outside of the bioethical sphere. So there's been a lot of bioethics and they're trying to take a little breather with a, l l I don't think this area is less controvertible than maybe a less controverted area, if that makes sense. Something that's more obvious. Let's say true things in an obvious area. Tornielli writes, the new text thus contributes to, the, to overcoming the dichotomy that exists between those who focus exclusively on defending nascent or dying life, abortion, euthanasia, while forgetting so many other attacks against human dignity, sounds like leftism out of the Francis Pontificate, and conversely, those who focus only on defending the poor and migrants while forgetting that life must be defended from conception to its natural conclusion. So there you have it. That's a pretty good synopsis, even though Tornielli is significantly more simpatici with Francis and Tucho than, say, I am. I, I agree with his summative statement. What, what I mean by I agree is the seamless garment. They're going to defend abortion. They're going to uh, sorry, uh, defend against abortion, as a Catholic should, but not in the manner of the 2004 CDF document, which will always stand up, that was released by Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger a year before he became Pope, on whether or not Catholics may vote for pro-abortion politicians, namely Democrats, namely in the American elections. Ratzinger says, short answer, 
no with a but long answer well yes with an if if it's not if it's the lesser of two evils but what ratzinger really says is that that makes clear from the heart of the dicastery of the doctrine of the faith is that only life veritably life issues are binding upon the catholic conscience in electoral politics that means abortion and euthanasia are the only two veritably life issues. Death penalty and war, specifically named by Ratzinger in this 2004 document, death penalty and war are prudential decisions. They're prudential decisions. One can, Ratzinger makes utterly clear, the direct quote, disagree with the Holy Father on issues like the death penalty in war, the application of the death penalty, which is not a Malam in say, and the application of war, which is not a Malam in say. So your one's conscience may do the math differently than any given Holy Father at any given period in time because these are not Malam in say. They're not evil in themselves. War and the death penalty are both conditional goods, according to 2,000 years of Catholic teaching. So applying the law to the facts and vice versa will be a prudential matter, and that's when we're allowed to form our own opinions. This is not relativism. This is how Catholic moral theology works. Do you see? But because abor abortion and euthanasia are always in every single instance malum in se, an evil in itself, there's, it's not merely a prudential departure of ways. If the Holy Father, as all Holy Fathers ever, including Francis, say abortion and euthanasia are wrong, well, there's not a single time where it could be a conditional good to have an abortion or commit an act of euthanasia. Therefore, you can never disagree with the Holy Father on it. Boom. Benedict, uh, sorry, Fran, uh, <laughs> Ratzinger, Monday, oh, Monday. Monday. Mondays are tough. Ratzinger, a year before he became Benedict the Sixteenth, makes this crystal clear in this little document. So, the seamless garment condemned by three different popes since the Second Vatican Council, by my count, three popes, is recondemned by Ratzinger there, and re he reclarifies that. This little Tornielli quote should not have been slung together so sympathetically to the point of view that is called the seamless garment. For those of you who don't know, the seamless garment is the idea that basically all issues involving quality of life count as true life issues. A life issue properly conceived is only one whereupon it is a malum in se to violate the teaching on the life issue issued by the Catholic Church because there is no exception that would avail one to uh, violate life. So beginning of life and end of life, as Tornielli says. Abortion, euthanasia, as Ratzinger said. More death penalty, immigration, that's a new one that's been big in the mind and on the heart of Pope Francis. He's talking about dignity because he's something of a globalist. He likes open borders. He wants migrant populations to be able to move across borders freely because he essentially wants that Beatles song to be true. Imagine a world without nations. And he's trying to put this on par with a life issue, and this has already been clarified by the church. Immigration, along with the death penalty and war, is a prudential matter for, for governments to work out themselves. More than, than, than death penalty and war, immigration is rather clearly taught by the church as um, it leans toward the side of being a threat 
against the Catholic teaching on honoring thy father and mother, their fatherland and their motherland, Thomas Aquinas makes it pretty clear. The same reason that we owe fealty to our, in a proportionate measure to our homeland, we should have a proportionate measure of patriotism based on how absolutely good or bad it, it is. We should also defend its borders. So Francis is endorsing the seamless garment indirectly in this document. Fernandez wrote that, quote, the church with the present declaration ardently urges that respect for the dignity of the human person beyond all circumstances be placed at the center of the commitment to the common good and at the center of every legal system. And that's banal enough to be general and general enough to be banal. Fine. He had earlier decried how a modern misconception of dignity is, quote, occasionally misused to justify an arbitrary proliferation of new rights. Sounds like a, a leftist acknowledging the summary view of a rightist about a leftist. I'll repeat it. Occasionally, dignity can be misused to justify an arbitrary proliferation of new rights, kind of like gender theorem. Many of these are at odds with those originally defined and are often set in opposition to the fundamental right of life. Now, that's, that's remarkable. The rights of the feminists, new rights that came about in large measure the second half of the 20th century, beginning in the second half of the 19th century, the rights of the feminists were set directly against the rights of the unborn children to be born, their right to life, and born children to have a mother at home, which is a right. The church says that that's a natural right to have your mother at home, or very close to a natural right, a concomitant of a natural right. So the rights of the feminists are adducing new rights, which actually, as a kind of zero-sum matter, deplete the true old natural rights of, you know, the, the true teaching of not only natural law, but the church. While mentioning the church's condemnation of abortion and euthanasia, the wink and a nod to the 2004 Ratzinger CDF document, the text only mentions sin on two occasions. This is life sight saying this. Both of which occurred in the same sentence in section 22. The treatment of gender theory was critical, but only critical, whilst Pope Francis under whose authority the document was written, has been much more condemnatory in his remarks. So Francis has been clear, gender theory theorem is wrong. In case any of you didn't know that, this is one of the kind of easy slam dunks where he can say something that's simultaneously orthodox and um, safe. But I would point this out because so, sometimes, and now I'm typically with Lysite in my condemnations of Francis's behavior and his doctrinal equipoise. But I'm never one of those guys that will like count the mention of the word sin or even the, the mention of our, our Lord's name in a Vatican document and judge the document based on that. Same thing like when Cabrini came out and I said, this is a horrible feminist worldly movie. Folks that joined me in condemning the movie, but were uncomfortable with condemning it strictly for its radical feminism, would say things kind of to agree with me, like, yeah, I just, you only see her praying once or twice in the film. So the paucity of good things is what they tend to decry, rather than the appearance of bad things. I like to stick in my criticisms, parish orphans and retrogrades, to the appearance of bad things. And what I talked about five, six, seven minutes ago, the tacit endorsement of the seamless garment by this document is the appearance of a bad thing. The paucity or the general lack of good things, like the lack of condemning sin or the lack of our Lord's name or anything like that, that, that never concerns me that much because there can be a good movie that doesn't have praying in it. Sorry, they just can. I mean, there can even be a good movie about a nun that lacks a lot of praying. I mean, we all know she's praying. 
It's, it's fine to say, well, let's show. We also don't see her brushing her teeth. It doesn't mean brushing your teeth isn't a good thing. People assume a nun prays. Folks assume that a document that condemns, I don't know, gender theorem as demonic also is inclusive of the proposition that if it's demonic, it's sinful. So I don't get so twisted off on this particular, though I normally tend to agree with LifeSide about this stuff, if that makes sense. Francis has been more condemnatory of gender theorem in his remarks than Tucho. That's true. I mean, look, I'm trying to, you know me, you know me. I'm not going to find bogeymen where they don't exist. I'm not going to ignore them when I find them. It's a pretty boring document. I knew it was going to be a pretty boring document. I had a conversation yesterday with my friend, Ryan, about how it was going to be a boring document. But there are some tells about the big uh, direction of travel insinuated here. You know, LifeSite also talks about the, the absence of any mention of Skittles. I agree that is sort of telling, but it's not as telling as they're saying. Maybe it's just not a document on that, but they would never do so. Just as, and I'm always up against this in, um, in conservative circles, just as, yeah, I don't like Transformers in sports, but you know what's worse? Women's sports. That's more dysphoric than Transformers in sports. At least you got men playing men's sports. <laughs> um, with, and, and conservatives just want to talk about, oh, we got to get the Transformers out of sports. Well, I want to get, I want to get women out of men's sports. Well, same thing here. Um, yeah, like we want, we want to um, acknowledge that transformers are are is a is a is a demonic ideology. That cartoon from the eighties, transformers is a demonic ideology, but what's more demonic and what's actually more ubiquitous and more threatening to more people? The first three letters, L and G and B. More threatening to more people than that pesky T. So I, I, I think that's where LifeSite's going, and I agree with this one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's demonic, but that's safer. Same thing I say in sports. Well, yeah, proper ontological gender dysphoria, which is transformers, is, is bad. We should get that out of sports. But you know what else we should get out of sports? Functional gender dysphoria. Get the women out of the men's sports. So, and why? Because it's more preponderant. It's more uh, numerically relevant. It, it affects more lives. It is messing up more lives to have women hating being, acting like women, even the ones that don't think they're dudes. So I, I think unlike the lack of much appearance of the word sin, which I don't think is really a big deal if they call it like a demonic ideology, I don't think that's such a big deal. I do agree with LifeSight that the lack of mention of Skittles is, is a more important vice to condemn sin to condemn than transformers just like feminism is a much much bigger deal in pro sports now much more negative destructive force in pro sports is the preponderance of feminism pushing the wnba hard that that's messing up tons of lives look at the female athlete triad much more than than this small minority of men who think they're women, but they're playing men's sports, so it kind of like double, double negative. A man who thinks he's a woman, but he's playing basketball or football or baseball or soccer, these are men's sports. So really, it's like two negatives makes a positive. It's a man who thinks he's a woman playing a man's sport, so he ends up in the right sport. It's actually all the women who shouldn't be in there. Anyway, that's an analogy I, I, I've nursed a little too long, but you, you get the point. I do agree with LifeSite in the second instance. Now, the backdrop to all this is the following, a little bit of history about the document. I, it's, it's a kind of banal document, but there's, you just got to see the seamless garment angle. You got to see the, it is true that the Skittles is missing, and that tells us, I think, where we're going with the Synod on Synodality. I'm going to get to that in closing next. But I do want you to see the history. 
The tech's been in progress, allegedly, since 2019, with Fernandez Tucho, doctrinal chief, stating that the initial 2019 version was unsatisfactory. So five years later, it gets dropped in new iteration. New version was compiled in 2021, which underwent successive edits and abbreviations. I'm still working on the LifeSite article today. While that version was approved by the Pope to the new DDF prefect in November last year, because Pope Francis has gone through like three. Francis then requested that the text highlight issues such as poverty, seamless garment, the situation of migrants, seamless garment, Violence against women, seamless garment, new form, feminist seamless garment, human trafficking, war, old school seamless garment, and other themes. If you mean by other themes, death penalty, war and death penalty are the classic 1960s and early 70s seamless garment condemned by three popes. But we have poverty, migrants, violence against women. That's a, that's a unique one. They just talk about this nonstop, the Marxists. Human trafficking, war, other themes, let's just call the other themes death penalty for lack of specificity on their part. In order to do this, this technically five-year-old document, which has been iterated several times, Fernandez wrote that a special body in the dicastery was tasked with, quote, an in-depth study of the encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which offers an original analysis and further consideration of, all, of the theme of human dignity beyond all circumstances. Now, this task force, tasked with an in-depth study of Fratelli Tutti, guess what? They're like the only people in Christendom reading Fratelli Tutti because nobody else, nobody read that thing, that encyclical. It's, by almost anyone's estimation, worthless, banal, when Francis, I'll put it this way, doesn't write something destructive to the faith, then his writings are the most banal things you've ever conceived of. Two and two is four. Remember when in the Regensburg Address in 2006, Pope Benedict released that document? I cite it frequently. It was very important in my philosophical education, moving me from studying secular philosophy to back to studying Aristotomism. Um, that was the document that I think made me want to do it, all about how there are three moments of Aristotle and Aristotelianism being pulled out of the popular Western consciousness, three moments between the Protestant Reformation and now. And I said, I made me think to myself, I want to go study Aristotle and Thomas to re-Hellenize the West. That's our big problem is we've been de-Hellenized. Well, similarly, um, Ratzinger made this mention of um, how there's this um, Byzantine emperor, um, Paleologus, doing dialogue. This is how the, the document opens, doing dialogue with a Muslim scholar. And Paleologus, the Byzantine emperor, says, yo, sorry, Islam has brought nothing new to the world that's not regurgitated Christianity. Beside the sword, the sword is the only thing that's new. This this element of violence and exploding things, um, that's the only new moment in Islam that isn't there in the one true faith Christianity. Interesting, right? It's either incredibly boring or incredibly violent. That's what I'm saying about Fratelli Tutti and this DDF document. Francis's pontificate, Francis's Vatican, let's say that. Simplicitaire is either incredibly boring, where he's restating two and two equals four, or incredibly violent to doctrine. And when it's not being violent to doctrine, it's being incredibly boring. So Francis brought nothing new but the doctrinal sword. That's kind of that's kind of the catch phrase from today, and it doesn't only apply to dignitas infinita. It also applies to Fratelli Tutti, which is the source text for Dignitas Infinita. And same thing with Laudato Si. There are moments that are really violent, sort of neo-paganism, you know, almost like, almost like 
Amazon Synod Earth worship in that document, but but he's shy of really saying anything big. So he's just being very boring. Whereas you get someone like Benedict XVI, who, particularly as the doctrinal chief under JP2, really said some interesting novel stuff, new ways of looking at very faithful teachings that were pretty good. I, I don't think much of his eight-year pontificate, and I don't think much of his early life as uh, a, a bishop, not the amount that everyone else does, but stuff like Regensburg Address, wow, that's a new way of looking at the last 500 years of Christendom when everything basically, when the bottom fell out, when it came off the tracks. He says, look, it's all three moments of um, pulling Aristotle out of the popular consciousness. The Protestant Reformation, then you had liberal Protestant theology at, at Tübingen, then you have cultural pluralism. And pretty, pretty much everything is downstream of that. I'm like, wow, that's new and important and faithful. Well, Francis is either incredibly boring or incredibly violent. So, Fernandez and a few others are part of this task force doing an in-depth study of Fratelli Tutti, which no one read. And with such additional changes made, Francis approved this new text to Dignitas Infinitae. It sounds like a car commercial or something. On March the 25th, which is the customary date of the Annunciation, although not comprehensive, wrote Fernandez, the topics discussed in this declaration are selected to illuminate different facets of human dignity that might be obscured in many people's consciousness. Dignitas Infinita, noted the Cardinal, is timed to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the UN 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now there is where you get another big nod to the leftism endemic to this document, to the seamless garment endemic to this document. It's, it's a commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the UN, globalist, anti-Christian organization, 1948, a big year for the UN, and for one world, new world order, you know, the creation of lots of new paradigms in 1948. And um, <laughs> among the 12 people that ever bothered to read end-to-end -end Fratelli Tutti because no one's interested in what... Even Francis fans aren't interested in what he has to say. He's not a, not a great mind, not a compassionate, super compassionate soul, even according to his friends. So no one's reading all his documents the way, you know, Leo the Thirteenth. You just read those things from end-to-end. -end. So this group of men, this cadre, calls Fratelli Tutti a Magna Carta for Modernity, that's hilarious. Um, Fratelli Tutti only served to guide the new iteration of the document since late 2023. And the influence of the Pope's controversial 2020 encyclical can be seen throughout it. Outlining this in his introduction, Fernandez wrote that Fratelli Tutti constitutes a kind of Magna Carta of our contemporary tasks to protect and promote human dignity. Now, you... I want you to think about this sentence and it tells you everything you need to know. I don't, I don't want to do a lot of detail on this banal document, but think about this statement as a kind of litmus test for Cardinal Tucho and his document, and he, he wrote it because Francis wanted him to. Listen to this sentence once again. See, like a Highlights magazine cover. See if you can spot what's not right here. Fratelli Tutti constitutes a kind of Magna Carta of our contemporary tasks to protect and promote human dignity. And, and, and I mean, disregard the metaphor calling a very unimportant document, Fratelli Tutti, likening it to something very important like Magna Carta, which is actually a Catholic document. Great, great sort of pre-American constitution, the, the basis for the American constitution. So forget that. Disregard the fact that it's a a very grandiloquent metaphor that aggrandizes something petty and pecunious like Fratelli Tutti. Disregard that. There's one word in here that gives the game away. One more time, I'll read it. Fratelli Tutti constitutes a kind of Magna Carta of our contemporary task to protect and promote human dignity. Wait a minute. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give it to you right now if you missed it. The word contemporary. 
Our task to protect and promote human dignity is not contemporary. The document itself is called infinite dignity, or you might call it eternal dignity. The document makes note of the fact that the teaching by the Catholic Church on dignity is timeless. So why are they making now a special kind of highlight, hollow-out provision for a new kind, a new set of tasks protecting and promoting human dignity? This sounds like SJW stuff. This sounds woke. A contemporary set of tasks. The set of tasks associated with, corresponding with, human dignity do not change. A human being, male form, wants to be functionally effective, wants to be true, good, brave, win the maiden, save the day. The only other kind of human is a human female. A properly ordered adult human female wants to be the handmaiden of a goodly man, wants to meet one, wants to please him, wants to aid in his tasks. She wants to be, whereas he is the glory of God, she wants to be the glory of man and indirectly the glory of that God. Those are the two types of humans, male and female. Their dignity corresponds with being made in the image and likeness of God. That means mind and will. We have mind and will. Two things that the animals don't have, even the, the, the monkeys or whatever. For all the similitude bodily, they have 0% of our mind or our will. And our dignity comes from being able to know the right things and love the right things, mind and will. A man knows I need to love the right things and to know the right things. And with the two of them, I need to do the right things as a man, as a human man. A woman knows I need to help. I need to be the help meet to my husband in thus and such ways. Therein lies our dignity. That's timeless. That's timeless from the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve. We are judged as either succeeding or failing in the spending of our dignity, our minds and our wills, based on that alone. Is it consistent with our telos? Getting to heaven the male way, getting to heaven the female way, Yes or no? Dignity, like all things, is given us for our telos, our goal. There's nothing changing or contemporary about that. Fernandez goes through and outlines four kinds of dignity, ontological dignity, moral dignity, social dignity, and existential dignity, denoting ontological as the most important since it belongs to the person as such simply because he or she exists and is willed, created, and loved by God. The moral dignity noted by the cardinal can be lost by virtue of sinning. Okay, this is very boring. Fernandez explains social and existential dignity as respectively referring to the quality of a person's living conditions. Okay, now that's just 1948 UN declaration type dignity. The, this is how they're, they're pulling in the thread of poverty. Remember Cardinal Sarah? Poverty is very good. Destitution is evil. We don't want people eating dirt. But poverty is good. Most of the saints lived in poverty. They want, as part of the 1948 UN, to identify this good thing, poverty, the poor of heart, as a bad thing and claim that they're going to eradicate it, which is a lie anyway. The UN's not going to do that. They're going to take away what we own by 2030. By 2030, allegedly, according to the UN and WEF, we will own nothing and be happy. We'll all be poor together and we'll be happy for it. So don't listen to the lie, but under the ruse of that lie, under the rubrics of that ruse, we're allegedly going to have a vanishing trick. We're going to witness it. UN types are going to vanish poverty. And that's why Fernandez is propping up this kind of dignity. Oh, well, if you live in poverty, you have no dignity. That's just not true. That's just not Catholic. So I had to get to that. That's why he makes up these four kinds of dignity, ontological, moral, social, existential. I don't know how existential should be expected to be different from ontological. But the point is, social and existential dignity um, refer to the quality of a person's living condition. That means they're going to get rid of poverty. That means they're going to do SJW stuff. 
and the type of dignity implied in the ever-increasing discussion about a dignified life and one that is not dignified. Well, Catholic social teaching, traditional Catholic social teaching, especially highlights supernatural and natural dignity. St. Thomas describes supernatural dignity, according to this article, in the following way, inasmuch as man actually and habitually knows and loves God, though imperfectly, and this image consists in the conformity of grace. Okay. Dignity in the human person comes from the love of the Creator. Okay, that's Catholic, that's in the document. That the dignity of the human person was revealed in its fullness when the Father sent His Son. That's great. That's very Catholic. The fact that all men are called to spend eternity with God. That's great. Most men squander it. Broad is the path to hell, narrow is the path to heaven. But we're all, we all have dignity. That means a fair shot because of, like I told you, our intellect and our will are oriented at the correct things at the outset. Dignity is inalienable and intrinsic, meaning someone doesn't lose their dignity just by becoming a murderer or something. It depends how you look at this, but even this is consonant with the teachings of Aquinas. Violations of dignity in the, doc in the document, um, certain topics constitute violations of dignity in this document. The self-professed non-exhaustive list by Fernandez here are the violations of dignity. And this is where you're going to get strong notes of revolution. Poverty is a violation of dignity. Disagrees with many of the Catholic saints, with Cardinal Sarah today, who wrote this beautiful treatise on poverty is beautiful. Destitution's evil. People shouldn't be eating dust. They should have enough food and clean drinking water. But that's not poverty. Poverty just means you have a simple life and you don't have much. So they're saying this is a violation of dignity. This is Agenda 2030. Remember, Vatican is Agenda 2030 adjacent. War. Theoretically, there's a just war. I, war is usually evil, but theoretically, there's a just war, and, and they're, they're saying all war is not a just war. The, tr the, the situation of migrants. Okay, this is pure Agenda 2030. They want borders gone. They, they want to say it is an outstripping, a depletion of human dignity every time that a migrant is turned away at a border. This is squarely against 2,000 years of Catholic tradition. Human trafficking, obviously. That's a funny one to be included in a Vatican document. Sexual abuse, another funny one to be included. In. Those two kind of go together. Of course, I agree they're a violation of dignity. But, you know, last hundred years, the Vatican's not really the pot that should be calling the kettle black here. Violence against women. This is a red herring that everyone agrees, but um, has the church been guilty of this? I don't think so. Why, is anyone going to defend violence against women? Abortion. They stick it right in the middle, but they've been pretty unequivocal. Yeah, abortion's always wrong. Surrogacy, IVF, stuff like that. That's wrong. Okay, thank you. Euthanasia and assisted suicide, okay, that's as categorical as abortion. This comes right out of the 2004 CDF document I talked about. Marginalization of people with disabilities, sure. Gender theory, okay. Um, sex change, okay. Digital violence, I don't know what that means. Um, now, as I insinuated before, the text does seek to do violence to Catholic teaching on just war theory. Text echoes another of Francis's key themes, namely denoting war as always being a defeat for humanity. Catholic social teaching traditionally outlines instances in which a just war might occur, but dignitas infinita suggests that today it is very difficult to sustain the rational criterion measured in other centuries to speak of a possible just war. Now, Francis tried to do it here. Francis and his boy Tucho, they tried to come up with a basically banal, boring, non-earth-shattering document where they're not waging any revolution at all. But Francis has so much of this revolutionary spirit, even in his boring documents, like Dignitas Infinita, he has to upset at least one apple cart. The apple cart here is the just war theory, which has always been associated with all the best teachers of the Catholic faith.
He has to say no more just war. To 2019, he said no more death penalty. And that's an irreformable teaching. No more just war isn't irreformable, but it's close. The intimate relationship between faith and human dignity means it would be contradictory for war to be based on religious convictions. That's just not true. All of the Crusades, at least all those aside from the Fourth Crusade, First, Second, Third, Fourth, uh, Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, were, were considered just wars. So he's now overstepped that bound, and he probably knows the Crusades are considered holy wars, just wars at the very least, but even more than just holy. And he's saying he's, he's always going to spit into the wind some. He's always going to piss on his own church some. This is Fernandez. So you can't have a holy war based on religious convictions. Again, this runs foul of um, cultural pluralism. This is what we were talking about with the Christ is King wars of the last two weeks, starting from Candace Owens being fired essentially from Daily Wire because she said Christ is king and believed Christ is king. By the way, Daily Wire, it's reported, had some all, kind of all-staff meeting over the weekend. And um, it, it sounds like, allegedly, Christ is king is like not kosher. Not, not kosher, and it seems sounds like allegedly it's been reiterated that way unless I heard something wrongly. So... Um, to say, remember, as Trent Horn tried to defend the condemnations of certain instances of Christ as king by saying, well, you know, anti-Catholicism is as bad as anti-Semitism. It's like, well, no, that's not true. Catholic culture isn't the same as Semitic culture. Well, cultures are not equally good. Same thing here. Same presupposition by Tucho. Today, it is very difficult to sustain the rational criteria matured in other centuries to speak of a possible just war. Hmm. That's weird. The intimate relationship between faith and human dignity means it would be contradictory, that means self-contradictory, for war to be based on religious convictions. Well, what about um, a war uh, between a Catholic and a Muslim, like the first or the second or the third crusade? Those are holy wars. So they always have to piss into the wind some. He, he quoted Francis' 2016 address on the World Day of Prayer for Peace. They always want to take at least a little bit of a piss on Catholicism. Now, they're good on, on abortion and surrogacy. Pretty good on euthanasia and assisted suicide. This is a little review for you. A special case of human dignity violation would be abortion, uh, uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide. Now, on gender theory, pretty good. Beginning his treatment of gender theory, Fernandez quoted from Amoris. The church wishes to reaffirm that every person, regardless of orientation, ought to be respected in his or her dignity and treated with consideration, while every sign of unjust discrimination is to be carefully avoided, particularly any form of aggression and violence. He condemned how, in some places, individuals are imprisoned, tortured, and even deprived of the good of life solely because of their orientation. The DDF prefect stated how the church notes definite critical issues with gender theory. The theory's scientific coherence is the subject of considerable debate among experts. That's giving away the game. That's not even true. It's not even real debate, writes Fernandez, adding that the church recalls that human life in all its dimensions, both physical and spiritual, is a gift from God. He wrote that modern gender theory denies the greatest possible difference that exists between living beings. Sexual difference. Pius XII writes about this beautifully. Difference between ethnic difference and sexual difference is a bigger difference. A much bigger difference. So that's good, but I mean, Tucho and Francis alike are two very, very feminist prelates. I thought sexual difference matters a lot. A man's a man, should act like a man, is called to act like a man. A woman's a woman. She's called to act like a woman, not act like a man. Yeah, they agree that a woman can't be a man, but can a woman do all the things associated with men? I think Francis and Tucho would say, yeah. That's not, that's not what today's about, though. We won't go through feminism. The discussion on gender theory strikes as being guarded in parts, notable by virtue of its absence. Um, this is the LifeSide article author now. 
Its absence was any reference to Skittles candy. The CDF's 1975 document Persona Humana instructed that there can be no true promotion of man's dignity unless the essential order of his nature is respected. End quote. While urging that individuals with home, home bodies who have tendencies to like Skittles be treated with understanding and help to overcome their trials, Persona Humana added that home-based Skittles acts are intrinsically disordered and can in no case be approved of. The avoidance of any coverage of Skittles in Dignitas Infinita, therefore, appears noteworthy. Yeah, a little bit. That's the end of the article. That's the end of our treatment of Dignitas Infinita. Knew it was going to be boring. It was mostly boring. There's some ways it wasn't boring. Hopefully I covered those ways. The synod on synodality rages on. We're going to go probably, I'm not sure, this isn't a full-on prediction, um, to reevaluate artificial contraception. Probably reevaluate very pro body, married Latin rite priests, Roman rite priests. Mm, who knows? Maybe something crazy that we're not expecting, like intercommunion with Lutherans. Um, probably some more language dignifying uh, SS couples, the positive aspects of their relationships, which all of these fantastic prelates have been flirting with oh so coquettishly since the midterm report of the 2014 synod We've been saying we want to talk about the positive aspects of relationships. And we're definitely going to see female deacons. They've already admitted that much. So the big game is synod on synodality, which got extended one more time into 2025. The October meeting of 2024 will not be the final meeting. And like I said already, that's the big game here. This has some role in that. Hopefully I've helped to clarify what that role could be. Mostly, it's just sort of a boring placeholder document. They have their marker. Francis always has his marker. All Francis has brought that's new is doctrinal sword. Everything else is incredibly banal, just like Islam. Everything else is like the most boring, obvious, didn't need to be said truism. There are three persons in the Trinity. There are seven sacraments. Unless he's waging absolute doctrinal revolution. And so this document further evinced, further showed how that's always the case with Francis. Brought nothing new but doctrinal sword. Very boring. We're not revolutionary. We'll see what comes of it. Deus Volt, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades. Exhortation.